Pronation and supination. You're probably rather familiar with the terms at this point in your studies, but how well do you really know the biomechanics behind the motion? A lot of students new to the field of anatomy and biomechanics might describe it as a rotation at the wrist, but the movement is far more complex than this and actually doesn't involve the wrist joint at all. If this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, don't worry. This is one of the main focus points as we discuss the bones and joints of the antebrachium. Good day, and welcome to this first session on our study of the antebrachium, or forearm. This is the region that extends from the elbow down to the wrist. In the first session, we'll consider the two principal bones of this region, the radius and ulna, as well as the joints that exist between them, both proximally and distally. Our objectives for this session are to identify the bony features of the radius and ulna, then look at the proximal and distal radio-ulnar joints, which are responsible for the movements of pronation and supination. We'll start with a bit of an overview of the antebrachium itself. The bones of the antebrachium, combined with the interosseous membrane projecting in between, divide the forearm into an anterior and posterior compartment. Once again, this compartmentalization helps us to group structures and functions. The posterior compartment contains the supinators of the forearm as well as the extensors of the wrists and digits. It's innervated by the radial nerve exclusively and supplied by the posterior interosseous artery. The anterior compartment contains the pronators of the forearm and the flexors of the wrist and digits. It's primarily innervated by the median nerve, with some notable exceptions that are innervated by the ulnar nerve. Blood supply is provided by both the radial and ulnar arteries. We'll start by continuing our look at the osteology of the forearm. We introduced the radius and ulna in the last session in relation to the elbow joint, but now get a more complete picture. First, consider for a moment the size difference. The ulna is larger proximally than distally, while the opposite is true for the radius. The proximal portion of the ulna resembles an ice cream scoop, with the impression made by the trochlear notch in the olecranon posteriorly and the coronoid anteriorly, which serves to articulate with the humerus. We previously identified the radial head, but now have a better view of its articulation with the impression on the lateral surface of the ulna, known as the radial notch. This forms the basis of the proximal radio ulnar joint. When looking at the shafts of both the radius and ulna, we see that each tapers at the side facing the other bone, the ulna laterally and the radius medially. This allows for insertion of the interosseous membrane between the two bony surfaces. The interosseous membrane is formed from dense regular connective tissue, allowing for both stability and mobility. It holds the radius and ulna in close approximation with one another, but still allows flexibility for the radius to wrap around the ulna distally during pronation supination motions. This concept can be demonstrated by taping a piece of paper between two cylinders. Like the fibrous interosseous membrane, the paper resists stretching, preventing the pens from separating. The flexibility of the paper, however, allows the pens to still be twisted about one another with relative ease. The same is true for the radius and ulna, as we will see in the action of pronation and supination. Distally, the radius and ulna come together once again, forming the distal radio ulnar joint between the head of the ulna and an impression on the medial surface of the radius, the ulnar notch. The distal end of the radius is smooth, forming the articulating surface that makes up a large portion of the wrist joint. The radial and ulnar styloid processes project bilaterally from the distal end of the forearm, helping to create a concavity in this region. The proximal radio ulnar joint is a synovial pivot joint between the radial head and the radial notch of the ulna. The joint is encased within the joint capsule and synovial membrane of the elbow joint, which actually projects inferiorly to form the pouch-like sacciform recess. This pouch is significant in that it provides laxity to accommodate twisting of the capsule during rotational movement. The joint is reinforced by a thickening of the joint capsule, known as the annular ligament. It's a unique design. It's anchored to the ulna both anterior and posterior to the radial notch. Note that the ligament is not directly attached to the radius, but instead curves around it, resembling a sling. The annular ligament tapers inferiorly to hug the neck of the humerus and provide the joint with stability, resisting inferior dislocation of the radius relative to the ulna. 
Although the radial carpal joint is strong in adult individuals, the fit between the radial head and annular ligament is relatively loose in toddlers. As a result, there is a tendency for the radial head to slip inferiorly out of alignment with forceful distraction of the forearm. Dislocation of the proximal radial ulnar joint, commonly referred to as handmaid's elbow due to the concept of children being pulled around by the wrist by a caregiver, can occur with sudden jerking motions, such as lifting a child quickly at the wrist, or from progressive forces over a period of several seconds, such as when giving a child a helicopter ride. Radiographically, the physician would be looking at the radiocapitate line. Now, this is an imaginary line through the shaft of the radius. When projecting beyond the radial head, the line should pass directly through the capitulum of the humerus, regardless of the angle of the radiograph. A diagnostic sign for proximal radio ulnar dislocation is a malalignment between these two structures in any radiographic view. You may also notice what at first glance appears to be a fracture line within the radial head. Remember though, this is a young patient population. You are actually looking at an epiphyseal growth plate, which are non-calcified and radiolucent. Fortunately, the injury is fairly easily reduced through a combination of supination of the forearm and flexion of the elbow. Clinically, this sort of injury is important to diagnose as it happens. Here we see a radiograph of an eight-year-old girl who initially reported weeks earlier with elbow pain. The dislocation originally went undetected, and a follow-up visit regarding the unresolved pain finally identified the dislocation. Notice the calcification within the annular ligament due to chronic inflammation that needed to be excised. Diagnosis is complicated by the fact that young children often have difficulty verbalizing the problem. Care providers should be cognizant of limb guarding, or a reluctance to use the affected arm, point tenderness above the radial head, and bilateral asymmetry with surface palpation of the radial head. The distal radial ulnar joint is found between the head of the ulna and the ulnar notch on the medial surface of the radius. Similar to the proximal radial ulnar joint, the distal joint is enveloped by the joint capsule of the wrist in the instance when the capsule projects proximally to form the distal saccaform recess to once again accommodate twisting between these articulating surfaces. It's another example of a pivot joint, but of a slightly different architecture. Notice that the distal surface of the ulna does not project as far distally as that for the radius. In the gap that's created, we find a piece of triangular fibrocartilage that forms the articular disc. The disc projects medially from the medial surface of the radius and anchors to the ulnar styloid process of the ulna. This provides an anchor between the two bones, where the attachment at the ulnar styloid process serves as the pivot point as the radius rotates through pronation and supination. It's important to note, then, that the ulna does not directly articulate with the carpal bones of the wrist. It's actually an indirect articulation through the articular disc. Also note that the articular disc appears to be subject to wear and tear, as thinning of the disc increases with advanced age, and perforations in the disc are found with greater frequency the older that people get. Combining the motions at the proximal and distal radial ulnar joint gives us a full appreciation of pronation and supination in the forearm. Looking specifically at pronation, in which the radius folds over the ulna, which bears some resemblance to the closing of a book. The pronator muscles, as we will later identify, extend across these joints anteriorly. Now, Using the book analogy, imagine an elastic band extending from cover to cover along the front of a book's spine. The elastic band represents the contracting pronator muscles, and the two covers represent the radius and ulna. Note that when the elastic recoils, the book will close, drawing the covers together. Similarly, when the pronators contract, the anterior surfaces of the radius and ulna will likewise be drawn together. Later, we will also look at the supinator muscle, which projects across the joint posteriorly. This serves to unwind the radius from the pronated position. Again, using the book analogy, this would be similar to an elastic extending across the back of a book's spine, which would recoil to open the book. That wraps up this session on osteology and arthrology of the forearm. On the other side of the break, we'll dive into the anterior and posterior compartments, starting with the muscles that make up the bulk of the antebrachium. See you then. <laughs>